Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. This is um, this is John Ram, and John, um, I think the audience ought to know that you and I are probably about two hundred yards away from each other. Yeah, but because of lockdown, we haven't gone into each other's houses. I know. I know. But we both live in Brighton. I hope that's not giving away too many state secrets. And um, <laughs> here we are, and we're meeting over Zoom uh, because, John, you you worked with Mike Alfreds, and Mike uh, talks, dare I say this, extremely fondly about working with you um, in Thank a number you. of the talks. Um, so. John, let's, let's start at the beginning. How on earth did you ever come across Mike and how did he ever come across you? Well, I'd obviously heard of Mike because he's he has sort of got legendary status and um, he's, he's one of those people who you think, I would love to work with Mike. Um, so the very first time I actually auditioned for him um, and this must have been in the late 90s, I think. Uh, and I think he was working with uh, David Glass on a project. And I can't quite remember what it was, but I worked with lots of sticks and things and movementy things, but I didn't get it. Uh, that, so that was the first time I met Mike. I didn't get the job. Then I auditioned for him for a play called Buried Alive by Philip Osmond, which we did at Hampstead and at Plymouth, I think. And... Um, I did get that job and that's when I first started to work with him. Right. And uh, what was the part and how was that experience working on a new play? It was a brand new play. Um, it was Scottish. I, I was playing a, a, a horrible uncle. Um, and it was a very dark play about children killing their parents and burying them in the coal cellar. But it was very... Um, it was an education because it was obviously it was the first time I worked with Mike. So the whole process was coming at me for the first time. So it was an incredibly intense period. Subsequently, you get to learn what Mike expects from you, but you, the first time you meet him in a rehearsal, you, and he helps you through step by step, but you are blown away by the, uh, by what you have to do, what, what, what you're faced with. Yeah. You mean that your experience up till then had not had what some of the intensity of f focus? I mean, well, what what um, from my experience beforehand, you know, you'd go into a rehearsal room and you would muddle through with the various tricks that you've learned as an actor and you would try things out until the director says, yes, you've got it right. Well done. Um, that's not the way that Mike works. It's not a question of trying out tricks or trying out different approaches until the director goes, that's it, stick with that, that's fine. And so that's that was my experience before Mike, is, is trying to get it right. Uh, but of course, Mike's process is not about getting it right. It's about, a, it's about living the process of acting, not about getting it right or wrong. Um, and of course, for a, 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 an actor, the first time you are faced with that and you're stripped of all your tricks, it's very exposing and you feel very, very vulnerable. And a lot of actors, when they first meet Mike, well, from my experience, become very unnerved and very defensive right from the beginning until they get used to the idea that actually what they're being asked to do is, is to be creative mm. and genuine mm. and when they realize that it's not a threat, that it's actually a gift, people begin to loosen up and understand where, where this is going. Um, Rad Rawi said something interesting, and see if this, this chimes with you, because you know you said about it being threatening when you first start. Rad said, Mike was never interested in your personal psychology. He wasn't probing to find out who John Ram was. Mm. So and that's kind of what you're saying, isn't it? That it's unnerving because it seems as though you're you're being stripped away, but it's not. It, it's not your private life that he's. No, and and I I think this is very interesting about Mike, at the at the moment where theatre and television is at the moment, that a lot of it is about, 
um, how do you feel? What is your personal experience? And you bring that to the show. Mike doesn't do that. Mike says, let's tap into the universality of human experience. What would it be like to be a Scottish paedophile, which is what I was in Buried Alive? What would that be like? How do you feel about, but not you as a person, it's got nothing to me as John Ram. It's what is my universal understanding, tapping into something. Mm. Um, and that thing that you tap into is storytelling. And this is what um, I think the essence of Mike is. He's a, he's a, he, he talks about storytelling, that you're, you're tapping into something bigger than yourself, universal. In, into myths and legends um, uh, that are bigger than you personally. Mm. But 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 you say that, and yet you're talking about in this instance, in this play, buried alive. You're talking about what I kind of remember as a sort of fairly naturalistic play. Yes, it was very naturalistic. Yeah. But then you're still saying that there's a sort of universality. I mean, it, but it, it, it's definitely not clear, or yeah. That's, that's human as well. I think I think that I think the 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 idea of Mike being interested in in storytelling rather than um, the actor's psychology still holds true. However naturalistic it is, it, that doesn't change the fact that what he's interested in is telling universal stories. He's he's not particularly interested. I might have, I might be completely wrong about this. It's just my impression, but he's he's not particularly interested in um, the, the the actor's psychology. Mm. And I've talked to him about other actors that 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 do go deep into their own psyche. But that's not universal. That's very personal, and that's a different way of working. I think. Mm. Mm. And. So you remember those early days or weeks, maybe even with Buried Alive, where you were going, this is so unfamiliar. I'm, mm. I don't know, I, I don't know how, how this is happening to me. What, can you remember any sort of specific stuff that you were being asked to do that really discombobulated you? Yes, I think, I think in, in a usual, in a normal um, rehearsal situation, you get up on the on the floor with the director looking at you and you try out different things and eventually the director says yes that's right mm -hmm. and because mike doesn't do that you try out different things and mike says okay well that's that's let's leave it at that you've made some headway you've made some discoveries but the point is not about creating something perfect to show the audience it is about creating um, the play living in your in your mind and your relationships with the other actors so that when you go on stage, you live it, you create it fresh, mm -hmm. every, which he goes on, you know, in his book, Different Every Night, that it's always, um, was it, I don't know if it was Mike or someone else had the metaphor of cooking a meal. And I, I don't know if other actors have mentioned this, is that when you cook a meal, you don't use ingredients that you've prepared weeks ago. You do it there and then, and it's fresh, and it's original, and it's living. Mm -hmm. And I think for Mike, um, that's the essence of theatre, that it's, it's a living thing. It's not drilled into the actor like a routine that you repeat night after night after night. Mm -hmm. It's created freshly on stage. Mm -hmm. And... So the rehearsals are completely different because you're not going for an end point. You're not creating something perfect. You're just creating the environment of, 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 of a process of learning, of developing, of coming up with ideas and thoughts and detail. Um, so it's a completely different experience for a young actor when you first meet Mike, completely different to what you're used to. And, and, the the idea of of kind of being open to the other actors of listening and being receptive uh you know that i think for a lot of actors is is scary as well isn't it yes yes it it's it's great fun when you it it becomes um playful um and a lot of theater isn't playful it's 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 
gultified and dead. But when you grasp what, what Mike is asking you to do is to be open and change your performance because of new ideas that you might have, new impulses that you have in yourself or that someone will give you. If you listen carefully, they'll give you different impulses and it becomes much more playful and fun. You know, it becomes fun instead of, in, it, it, I think uh, early on, I, I used to think that if I, if I got it, I could get a performance perfectly if I did it if I, if I sort of shaped and molded it and it became a, a, a little crystal, a hard crystal of a performance that I could do perfectly every night. And what, of course, Mike showed me was not only was that not desirable, but it was impossible. And that it's much better uh, to be free and open and open to ideas in the moment. Mm. Um, and that's what a living performance is. And, and how, how frustrating if you've got your crystalline performance, if somebody you're working with does something different. Yes. Then you come off the stage and you're going, what were you doing tonight? Exactly. <laughs> and I think that we've all had that, I think, of, of, of actors who may not be quite as sympathetic to this way of working, who will come up saying, what the hell are you doing? You didn't do that last night. And, and subsequent to working with Mike, of course, you know, the, once you've worked with Mike once or a few times, this stuff stays in you. You don't, it's very useful to use with any production. And um, it has, it sometimes is unnerving for other actors when they realize that you might not be doing the same thing every night. It can be unnerving. But have you then experienced that? You've gone into another yeah. production where, where the, where, as it were, the, the, everything's blocked and yes. set. That has happened, yes. I was doing um, a production of, um, it's not fair to say actually, so I won't say what production it was or who was in it, but yes, it was an older actor and I was doing uh, uh, a Shakespeare. And um, it was, it was all, it, at the beginning it was awkward when he wasn't trusting that I was, you know, um, it, that I was a safe pair of hands, which because I would I kept changing things and um, yes, that was awkward in, for a while. It got better after that when he trusted me and it was okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, you you've interestingly we haven't talked a, a lot about Philip Osmond. Um, Mike had a, had a long. Um, collaboration with him was Philip in rehearsals all the time. Yes, he was. Yeah, he came in quite frequently. And did he did he uh, change stuff? Was was it a, was it? A... I don't think so. I I really don't think so. I don't remember him changing the script or anything like that. No, I don't think so. Mm, they'd probably done all that work. I'm sure. Yeah, and Mike does um, a hell of a lot of work prior to rehearsals. So he's. He's done all your homework for you. I mean, he expects you to do it, but he knows if you're cutting corners because he's already done it. Yeah. He's done. He does an enormous bit, an amount of preparation before a production. Yeah, and that must does that make you feel kind of secure? As um, y yes, it, it does. But the, the it, it also makes you feel well he, um, a bit nervous because Mike knows so much more than you do about things and. Uh, you know, he, he leads you, the whole point of the rehearsal is it's a process of discovery. But um, if you don't discover things, then he'll have to prompt you to discover them. Yeah. Yeah. Because he knows them. Do you ever remember working on, uh, j j talking of techniques? Okay, I'm going to throw a, a curveball at you. Do you ever remember in any of the productions you did with Mike working on actions? Y yes. You know, actioning a, a sentence or a thought. Yes. And did you ever, did you find that useful as an actor? What I find, what I found useful about, because there's lots of different exercises that Mike does. It, uh, um, that, that you may or may not find relevant or useful in that moment, but what they do, all of these, and there's thousands of them, little funny exercises that Mike does, is that they build up over time and even if you don't think they have any consequence or relevance to you or what you want to do or how you feel about the part, it, it builds up within you. 
And the idea is for you to have a comprehensive understanding, not only of your character, but the world of the play and the possibilities you have at your fingertips. And so all of these little exercises just um, give you the confidence eventually to know that when you're out on that stage and there is no direction, he's not a director in that sense, you know, you don't, he doesn't direct anything. Once you're out on that stage, you have the confidence to know that you are working with these other people in in um, an in a, an understood world, uh, and that you are informed when you make the choices that you have to make. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, some of the exercises I remember being rather dull. You know, quite boring. Some of them. There's one where you would have um, another actor before you've learnt your lines, or even after you've learnt your lines feed you the lines in your ear and then you say them so you don't have to remember the line someone says it for you in your ear and you deliver it and then for the next actor someone's delivering lines to them and of course this takes all takes time and you know you want to get going as an actor and start finding where the fireworks are and if it's always broken up by this voice in your ear it's very frustrating but you know it it always leads to some form of um, something interesting. And even if it doesn't, as I say, it sort of just builds up your library of thoughts and ideas and possibilities as the process goes on. Mm. Nice. OK, good. So you, you've, you've done that. You've done it in Hampstead. Does it, does it get, I mean, is it well received as a, as a piece? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, um, but I I enjoyed it so much working with Mike that that shortly afterwards we went I think our next project that I was asked to do was Cymbeline at the Globe uh -huh. and I think this is where I really really uh, because the the way Mike did Cymbeline and I think he did it before this as well but the Cymbeline we did at the Globe was no costume. We all had the same costume of a white trousers and shirt, no props. Um, and no, we had one musician on stage with us. And so it was three identical dressed people telling, how many of us, I think there may be five of us, telling the story of Cymbeline. And I've never felt so vulnerable and exposed on stage. And so that all you've got to rely on is the homework that you've done with Mike to tell the story of Cymbeline. And as you know, Cymbeline is probably one of the Shakespeare's more complicated plays with traveling to Wales and heads being chopped off. And to do that without props or special effects or scenery of any kind um, was a real eye opener because I was very doubtful that this would work. But then I realized that because Mike is all about storytelling, that that's what theater is, it's storytelling and, and if, if, if the audience um, isn't shown a head being chopped off, but told a head has been chopped off, they're absolutely happy to accept that. Mm. They'll believe it. Mm. Um, so it was the first time I really saw the huge power that Mike has on stage, that it, it is a, a formidable force of theater. Um, this storytelling propless, seamless costumeless thing is is extraordinary when you see it done i saw i saw the first production oh and um uh because i and i've said this elsewhere but you know this just absolutely sort of blew me away because you know you just got this fantastic clarity of storytelling as you said yes I and mean, it did the, the joy one of the things, the joy of watching actors have, having to transform so often, mm. because presumably you were playing more than one part. Yeah, I had a few parts. I was a Yakimo, I think his name, Ar 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 Arthur Argus. I can't remember the names now. Um, but what I realised is, is if, if you don't feed the audience props and scenery, and all they've got is the spoken word and your bodies, and basis the basics of storytelling it's um 
it's not only liberating for you as an actor, it's liberating for them as an audience because they can follow the story and they can follow a story because that's all it is really. And the props and the costumes are just um, add-ons, but all you're doing is storytelling. And, and when you get it down to its very, very basic, which Mike does, which is basic storytelling, it's, it's, it's liberating. Mm. I mean, I, ha I have been puzzling about what you did about the trunk that Yakimo comes out of. Oh, yes. What, <laughs> what did you, well, how did he do it when you... I don't think there was anything. I don't know whether you had a trunk. Did you have a trunk? No, I had my arm above me like this was for the lid. That yeah. was my trunk and I opened the lid and then I climbed out. Yeah. This, this is uh, this is a, an evil character, just for anybody who doesn't know Cymbeline. <laughs> An evil character inside the bedroom of Imogen, is that right? That's right. So the scene goes on with Imogen in the room, with me crouching like this <laughs> in my trunk, because I've, I've told everyone I'm getting into a trunk, so no one's confused. Well, I hope they're not. I'm in a trunk. And then I open the lid <laughs> and climb out, and everybody gets it. <laughs> Fantastic. And of course, that in itself would be such a joy to watch. <laughs> well, someone okay. climbing out of, a, out of, out of a, a pretend trunk. Yes, yes. And looking around. Did you, um, how was the technical, I mean, presumably, had you worked, John, in such big spaces as the globe before? Um, uh... I don't think, I think that was my first Globe experience, I think that was. But I'd worked at the National and I'd worked at the RSC. Oh, I see. So, so I, was, I was used to big spaces, yeah. And that was all fine. I mean, you know, I was talking to Jane Arnfield about Cymbeline and, you know, I don't, I've, I don't know what the challenges are for you as an actor. I obviously never performed there. Um, it's, it's a very, very good space it worked for Mike's production of Cymbeline very, very well, because what you have to do at the Globe is talk directly to the audience. Um, and you never, ever pretend that they're not there. That doesn't seem to work for in the productions I did at the Globe. You have to talk to them as they are there. You, you acknowledge the audience and you speak to all of them wherever they are in the in, in that vast room around you, behind you. Um, and that works for Mike's um storytelling uh theater that works very very well because you're not pretending that they're not there they're very much part of your show yeah because that was one of the um you know the surprises i think when when i saw cymbeline and science fictions beforehand and people talked about arabian nights was it you came in and it was all the lights were up yes that's you the thing know. all the lights are up you can There's see the chairs and distance the actors yeah. from from the audience yes yeah yeah and I've worked with um I've worked on another couple of shows with Mike with more or less props and costumes but that one was I think was probably the purest I did in that there was no there was nothing apart from the story um so and a lot of lines oh my god because there was only a few of us in the production then the number of lines we had to learn oh, was phenomenal did you have a, a long rehearsal process? A long we did, yes, we did. I think it's at least six weeks, if not more. I can't remember. Well, for Mike, that's minuscule, by the way. Six it may have been. It may have been eight weeks. I can't remember to be honest. Yeah. But I remember it was much more than I, I was used to. Three and a half weeks, you know, a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. In rep and stuff. So um, after Cymbeline. After Cymbeline, we did, I think it was Midsummer Night's Dream we did there oh. at the Globe again, uh, which was, again, wonderful. I played Bottom, which was a treat. Loved it, loved that enormously. Now, that's quite interesting, actually, doing comedy, because as a comedian, what I was used to and am used to is that you you um you come up with ideas and you practice and practice and practice there's a there's a science to comedy of of getting things right and if you get them wrong you don't get a laugh if you get them right you get a laugh and it is almost scientific the timing the the the, the rule of three the these things uh 
in, in verbal comedy and clowning. You practice them and practice them until you get it right. After all, in Commedia, they each character would spend a lifetime practicing their routines and their character until it was right. Um, but of course, with Mike, you can't do that. You can't have routines that you know will work because that's not in the spirit of what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to achieve something much fresher. So that was a challenge on Midsummer Night's Dream, coming up with um, new and original ways of doing comedy, improvisational ways of doing comedy night after night after night. Mm. That was interesting. And did you have uh, nights when you weren't funny? Yes, inevitably, inevitably. Uh, and I would also do things that Mike thought were thought was uh, w one thing that Mike talks about a lot is taste, because of course, if if you have the world at your disposal and you can do anything, he's given you license to do what you like. It's got to be within the bounds of the play and the character, and also this thing called taste, which is, you know, whether it's. Mike approves of it, you know, whether he likes it, whether it's in the, the world that he wants to create and that you don't veer too far from that. Um, and I, I think on or at least on one occasion I did by by doing something so crazy and wacky that Mike didn't like it. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. Um, were you I mean, yes, I can see with bottom, you know, you've got You've got so many kind of visual gags, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. And we did, you know, in 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 all honesty, we did have stuff that we repeated. Yeah. Because it was sort of inevitable, but we but we really tried not to. Yeah. Yeah. No, because it was interesting because Jane said that there was a point in I've forgotten what production it was where where she discovered that she was sitting on the on the side of a chair every night at the same point, you know, and after a while she thought, "I've got to do something about this, mm. you know, and I'll, mm. I'll I'll throw it up in the air again." And, mm. see what happens. and there have been, I mean, it's, it's so interesting talking to Pam about moments when something so different happens, and really, as you as an actor had no clue that that was going to happen. Mm. But it works, you know, because you're absolutely yeah. so present with what you're doing. It is. But it is. It's always risky, isn't it? It's always risky and unnerving and exposing to do something completely different. Because as actors, I think our natural impulse is to do the safe thing. The thing that worked last night, that got the laugh and the round last night to do that again, because that was great. But yeah. Oh, well, that's uh, so interesting, isn't it? Gosh, I can see this. For Midsummer Night's Dream, Mike Mike talks very very amusingly about how in rehearsal with Midsummer Night's Dream, um, uh, he did all sorts of things like turning the lights out because it was night time in the forest, and blindfolding you and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and he said, "Well, Shakespeare, you know, did it all for you. You know, he tells the audience that it's night time. Mm. You as actors don't need to." You know, you don't need to do all that. You don't need to have your eyes closed or whatever. Mm. So, mm. so, and interestingly, with Cymbeline, I'm talking, I'm talking about sort of dead ends, but but sort of what you're saying about how that can still contribute. A dead end for for Cymbeline the first time was getting all the Welsh people to come out of caves, kind of bent over because the caves are so small. You know that they're constantly sort of coming out of the caves mm. um and he said you know it's just it's just no point it just mm. in the end we we just discarded all that yes there is an awful lot of discarding um as you discover more and more stuff you know you do throw away an awful lot um and 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 sometimes it's stuff that you think oh but that'll work that'll be great but no you discard it you discard it and you discard and discard and come up with new stuff it's kind of like geological layers, though. That's how you're talking. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Because, of course, you do need enormous amount of confidence to work this way. And you only get that by 
paying attention in rehearsals and building up this um, very, very comprehensive character and relationship with the other actors. It's got to be comprehensive because if it isn't, it's going to be such a mess, a horrible mess. And, and very scary, very scary indeed, if you haven't built all this up and you don't trust the other actors, you know, it's very scary. I was going to ask about that. I mean, you know, one of the key things that everybody talks about is the trust that you have to have. Because if you come with your perfect, um, what did you say, not fossilised, but your crystalline performance, you don't need to trust another actor. Because no, that's right. You just do your thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we've all seen that. It, it sometimes, it also has its dangers, I have to say. And there was one production we, in, in Cymbeline, Mark Rylance was playing um, Posthumous. And um, at one point we, we were sort of dueling and fighting. And um, I bowed my head to look at the stage and I could feel something touch my head. And my character as the Yakimo, I thought, I'm, this is, I'm being humiliated. He's touching. So I, I, I threw my head back in defiance. What I didn't realize is that Mark was kissing the top of my head. And I <clears throat> cracked him on the mouth. And he sort of, he reeled back, clutching his mouth. And I thought, oh my God, I've taken his teeth out now. So, so there are, <laughs> you know, it can, it can sometimes be a bit scary if you know if you're not in control of it yeah and I should have I should have been more aware I guess of what was going on but you can see how it does lead to occasionally lead to sort of uh less fortuitous results yeah yes because it, it, it the 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 kind of um and again uh, um, Pam I think talked about and Rod, sort of the antennae that you have to have. Yes. You can't sleepwalk your way through this. No, you can't. Absolutely not. No. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. So listen, you've done Cymbeline. You've done, um, you've had a good time. Well, you've, you've been at the Globe, you, uh, hopefully a good time. Um, any more work with Mike? Yeah, we did. Uh, then we did at the RSC, we did um, Pedro the Great Pretender, um, which is a, a Cervantes play. Um, and surprisingly, this is a play that had never been performed. I think it had been performed in one college by students at some point, but it had never been performed professionally in Spain. And it hadn't been performed professionally in this country either. Um, and so that was a huge honor to take on this unperformed Cervantes play and uh, really, really go for it. And not only that, we took it to Spain and we performed in Madrid. And I was talking to Mike actually, and just saying that that was one of the highlights of, of uh, my career is to perform Cervantes to a Spanish audience was just amazing. Oh, wow. So a uh, translation by Philip Osmond. Yes, it was, yes. Um, and apparently very, very, uh, he looked at all the different kind of meters and patterns in the language. Yeah. He was very careful. Did it work as a play? Not, not, not as a production, but as a play. Well, now this is something that I, it, it, it is difficult, it's a difficult question to answer because I absolutely loved it. I mean, I was playing Pedro, so why wouldn't I? But I thought it was interesting and so innovative what Cervantes was doing because by the end of the play, he stripped everything back and said, Actually, we're just actors, to be honest. I'm just an actor, which, which you know, we're used to now in this day and age, that sort of... Uh, Meta theatre. Yes, but Cervantes was doing it way, way, way back. And that was so fascinating. It felt like him and Mike were on the same page, you know. It was great. Um, funny play? Very funny. Some, yeah, some, some wonderful... Um, set pieces in it and songs and dances and all of that yeah and and um, a set and costumes no um, we had chairs we did have costumes yes we did um, and that was interesting too because it was um, oh, what's the lovely 
I'm trying to think of the costume designer. Oh, this is awful. I've forgotten her name. You'll probably remember. No, you, uh, you, don't worry about it. But what she said was, you can create your own costume. So here are all the rails. Uh, go over and put together a costume. If it doesn't work, change it in rehearsals until you, which is such in the spirit of Mike, of course, is yeah. that your, it, your, your costume evolves with you as a character. Yeah. Yes, I remember him talking about that and saying, you know, that freedom to, because of course, bu a, a building, creating a set sort of in advance of a production for Mike was always very yeah. tricky. If there was a set, you know, he wanted it to be able to evolve, like you're yes. saying, with the costumes. Yes. So, was uh, was was there um, was there kind of music that was? Uh, were there musicians? And yes, there were musicians, um, and that was lovely because it was you know Spanish Spanishy music, and yes, it was gorgeous. Which, which, which theatre? Um, we did that up at the um, Swan, and we did it in a. I think it's called the Olympia or the Olympia something in Madrid. Um, yes. Did they understand it over there? We did it with surtitles, I think, if, if, I, if I remember correctly. Um, and I learned a tiny bit of Spanish. Treti episodios de la vida de Pedro de Urdamalas. How's how I opened the show. <laughs> <laughs> Which means? Um, 13 episodes from the story of Pedro the Great Pretender. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so you practice that? Yes, yes, yes. It's like <laughs> the Rolling Stones going to a, a country and being able to say a few sentences at the beginning of their, of their concerts. In, 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 exactly. In, but they were very, very, very generous because it is taking calls to Newcastle. And the, I, I think after that first performance, when they were so, um, their response was so effusive, I just felt this huge weight of relief and thoroughly enjoyed it from then on. Wow. Yeah, very generous audience. One of the things that um, people are starting to sort of lament is the fact that there is no visual record of any of these productions. Mike, is, is, Mike has never been interested. He, he's kind of said, you know, theatre is ephemeral. Yes. It comes and yes. goes. And yeah. so nobody's videoed. And so presumably we have no videos of of that play either. I don't think so. I don't yeah. think so. Photos. Are, are you do you are you a keeper of photographs and stuff? No, I'm not. You're not I'm, either. Not. Um that's just me. I mean I wish I was, because it would be lovely to have a visual record of everything, but no, I'm just not yeah. that's just not something I've ever done really. And so is that is that the end of your relationship with Mike? Well, we, we've done workshops and things since then, but th that's all I can recall at the moment, unless I've forgotten a production. I don't think so. Mm. Mm. But it was, um, th the time I worked with Mike was sort of a concentrated period of about four years. And about, about 2005, you said? Yes, exactly, 2005. Um, and the result of that was a lasting uh, effect on my acting and confidence after that date. So, you know, I, I, I suppose I was sort of in my, what would I have been? Yes, in my thir late thirties when we started, early forties. And so, you know, I, I'd been working for decades before I met Mike. But afterwards, I really felt like I was beginning to make some progress mm. Mm. as an actor, you know, in my development as an actor. Yeah, yeah because I begin to, began to understand the process and that there was a process. And that I had a useful process Yeah, from that uh, point onwards. Did you take a load of that stuff to anything else that you were doing, even if, even if the director wasn't using any of that? If you wanted yeah. to, you could use it yourself. Absolutely. Always, always use it. And... Um, I think, I don't know if other actors have mentioned this, but I often feel that uh, when I'm acting that I have Mike sort of almost on my shoulder um, and this thing taste, um, I, I, I sort of go, well, you know, is that tasteful? Is that, 
is that appropriate or am I showing off? You know, what is that a trick? Is that is that am I just doing that because I think I'll get noticed? You know, and we all do that as actors because we're show offs. But um, I try and I try and adopt <laughs> Mike's <laughs> um, feelings about taste as well. well. So taste is something I'm going to bring up with him because that's a, such an interesting word and it's a difficult one because because it's sort of it's redolent of um, of kind of people drinking nice cups of tea and saying, well, I'm not sure that I like that particular. You I think know? all it means is that if if you're given the keys to your own performance, you know, you could do anything, you know, with if you wanted to. Once you're on that stage, you have no direction. You could do what the hell you like. So all taste means really is that it's the uh, it's the you're 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 within the agreed bounds of the world that you set. So the, every world has its limitations. And if you start pushing or breaking those limitations for effect or for a joke, for a gag, and you break, you start to you start chipping away at the walls of this world you've created, mm. then the whole thing it doesn't work. It begins to sort of pull apart at the seams. Mm. So taste isn't isn't about whether it's polite or, <laughs> or or you know dainty in any way it's it's literally about whether it serves the purpose of the world you've created and if you break those bounds through through ego um or or or, or, or sort of a mistaken idea of what the audience wants that's the other thing you know you, you don't perform because you, you you're being led by the crowd you you, you, you're in the world of the theater, of the, of the, of the story you're telling. And uh, so I think that's what taste is. It, 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 it's, not a, it's not sort of drinking tea in the tea rooms. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, that's really, it's, it's lovely to, to sum that up. I mean, I had an extraordinary experience with a, a visual reality thing, which reminds me of this, because you can go into this world but apparently, well, no, this happened to me. You, if you push beyond the wall of the virtual reality, the, there's another world out there, which is the real world, as it were, and it was all ghostly. Mm. And then you come back in again and you're inside the world. And uh, Mike talks a lot about worlds, you know, how much work goes in, in rehearsal, into kind of creating this world. Of I think that's really interesting talking about virtual reality. I think that's that's a very very that's really interesting about Mike creating or the actors creating a world and the virtual world that you can see, because they're not so dissimilar. No. Um, but even in virtual, as you say, if you break the walls of virtual reality, you've sort of broken the spell, really. Yeah, exactly. You've broken the spell. Yeah. And, and, and that world doesn't have to be a rigid little little world, you know, no, it is, yeah. you know, all of the different pieces that Mike has worked on and that he's talked about, you know, demand different kind of ways of thinking. Yes. You know, and getting yeah. the actors to think in a different way to, to That's you know, right. inhabit physically a, a different. Yes. Physicality. That's right. And physicality, that's the other thing is, you know, he works a lot in with Laban and um, movement. And it's not just um, uh, an intellectual process. It's a physical process mm -hmm. and a spatial process. Yeah. So that emotional, uh, the emotional truth is a physical truth as well as a, uh, an intellectual truth. Thank you for watching. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that uh, that chat. And if you did, would you press the like button and also um, the uh, the subscribe button? That would be great. And if you wanted to be given alerts to when the next one is happening, just press the bell button. Um, if you want to put any comments or any questions underneath here, underneath the video, please do and. At some point, I will um, re-interview Mike, as it were, and put some of these questions to him. So um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.